Jose's as chairman of the collection for the town of Rondo. We're going to start the meeting this evening with introductions, and we will start with the Chuck Walton. Good evening. I'm Chuck Lawton. I'm chief economist at Planning Decisions, and the town has hired me to present the findings of the fiscal analysis of the uh, choice between staying in the RSU and going a run alone. Thank you. I'm Dalton Jones Hayes. I'm chairman of the selectmen this year. Dan yeah, Dubois. Joe Wadley. Tom Dan. Dan Beck. Dan Robbins. John Rennell. I would ask first that you please, if you have your cell phones, turn them on. If you turn them off, whatever, if you want to vibrate. Also, when it comes to the question and answer period, we do have a microphone and a stand over here. If you would please, there's a sign up sheet, sign your name, because we are making a record of this meeting. We do need those names for the record. Also, if you would please remember, and I'm sure you will, to please be polite. No side conversations. If you wish to have a side conversation with the person next to you, Please leave the room, go out into the hall so it's not to disturb anyone else. If we have people here from out of town who wish to speak at this meeting, we do not have a problem with that. However, we do wish that you would wait until the end of the meeting when everyone in town has had a chance to ask questions and then bring your questions uh, forward. Uh, with that, those of us at the head table, I'm going to move down here to the front so that we will be able to watch the presentation. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this, is this on? Thank you all for coming out tonight. Again, my name is Chuck Lawton. I'm with Planning Decisions. We're a consulting firm that does community and economic development work, and we were asked by the town to examine the fiscal implications of the choice before you. And what we've tried to do is examine options and come to a method for trying to think about the decision of going in or staying out. Um, I'll do a brief presentation, and those of you who were uh, at the selectmen's meeting last week um, know that I'll try to keep it a lot briefer and focus on the key elements and facilitate questions that you may have about that. First of all, this is complicated stuff. Everybody here is engaged. And what I'm trying to do is to present ways to think about the issue from a fiscal standpoint and not provide a correct answer. I don't think there is a correct answer. This is about the quality of education, how much people are willing to pay for the quality of education. And what I'm going to try to do is elucidate as best I can the factors that will affect how much it's going to cost to provide education under two different options. Um, the first, just in terms of approach, <coughs> what I would like to do is to deconstruct the most recent budget, the fiscal 2013 budget asking, in effect, had Arundel been alone, what would it have cost to operate exactly the same thing that is operating in fiscal 13, alone versus in the RSU, and use that to illustrate a couple of important points that I think are necessary to think about going forward. And in many ways, education funding is like health care funding. You've got one arena over here where people actually do the work. 
teachers and students learning, and another arena over here, and hospitals and doctors and patients, and another arena over here, insurance companies, state bureaucracies, where they decide how much they're going to pay for what is being done. And so part of the issue today is to think about that separate financing bureaucracy and how it affects what's paid for. So the factors that create the difference are, first of all, the what's called the EPS formula. The state of Maine provides money based on what it calls essential programs and services. It's a, in effect, a system of metrics that Augusta has that says, for this number of students of this capability, this set of characteristics demographically, economically, this is what we think it ought to pay a cost, and this is what will help subsidize. If you want to spend more than that, that's certainly up to you, but the EPS is what the state says is a minimum uh, acceptable level of financing for education in, in all the communities across the state. It then says, you in the state, <clears throat> in, the, in the municipality, have to provide a minimum mill rate towards that. The higher the mill rate, I mean, the higher the valuation in your town, the more you would end up having to pay, the less the state would provide, and vice versa. So the EPS is determined is used for two things. One, to decide what's the state minimum level of funding, and two, how much the state is going to contribute towards that. The second is new debt service, that there are proposals that will be considered for renovation of this school, renovation of the consolidated schools uh, in Kennebunk, and the um, high school in Kennebunk. That would be in addition to continuing operation of the existing schools. Then there will be a question of operational efficiency. If Arundel goes it alone, will it be able to operate this building the facilities, the transportation, the um, maintenance, the um, special education needs, the technology needs, at the same cost per student as is true for the RSU as a whole, or will Arundel alone, and this is a question for whomever would be on the school board managing that, that system, could we operate this more efficiently at a lower cost per student and lower the cost, or are we going to have diseconomies because it's a small school, we've got to have an administrator, we've got to have a superintendent, we have to have a special ed director, and our administrative costs are going to be above the current average, which would tend to make it more expensive. So those are not, again, answers that, that I can decide or that you can do a mathematical formula and decide. It's going to be how effectively can a standalone school system operate administratively. Um, the next is special education. That's largely an actuarial question. Individuals with special needs come and go randomly in the population. People have certain <coughs> extra needs. Today, many of those students are served through facilities available at the RSU. Were the town to withdraw from the RSU and not have those available, they could face substantial increases in cost for residential placement or special non-school uh, placements simply depending upon the nature and, and um, number of students with special needs. So that's in a sense a very spiky thing. If you had two or three students in a particular year, your cost might go way up, and in another year they might go way down. So looking at a share of last year's uh, RSU total and saying, well, if we had 23 percent of the students, we presume all the students, our uh, special needs are distributed equally across all the students, so we can operate at 23 percent of the states, I mean, of the RSU's uh, numbers, maybe we can survive. If we get more, it's going to cost more. If we get less, it might not cost that much. That's a judgment that, that the citizens are going to have to make. 
Um, so with all those factors in mind, then, what I wanted to do was to create alternative budgets and then examine implications for the longer term. So the first point to be made about the EPS system is that, and this is table four in the sheets, is that in the fiscal 2013 budget, which was only an RSU budget, the left hand column here is a $35 million budget for the RSU, it gets allocated to Arundel based upon an EPS and mill formula that says there was 3.3 million that was allocated to the RSU as a local contribution. Then RSU operations <coughs> over and above EPS were allocated on a 60-40 basis, 780,000, the adult education, <coughs> the um, local only RSU debt, which was part of a revolving loan fund that the RSU borrowed from to make improvements um, in all of the schools. That's allocated on a 60-40 basis. Um, that brings Arundel's total payment required in the RSU to 4.1 million, which based on a municipal valuation of 385 million came to Ten dollars and sixty-six uh, cents a thousand of municipal valuation. So that's in effect the cost within the RSU in 2013. The question then becomes: If we were to operate independently of that, what might we do? And again, not to have made a recommendation for one or another, but simply to present alternatives for you to consider and think about as a way of, in effect, building an Arundel alone budget. What I did was take the budget as it might be extracted from the RSU budget and say, let's look at options A, B, and C. Option A is the lowest cost, most efficient. This is the innovative and risk-taking, if you will, budget. The cost for the Mildred L. Day School taken directly out of the RSU budget, about 1.57 million. Tuition for 6 to 8 to Thornton Academy and to 9 to 12 to any public school. It could be Thornton Academy, but there are some that go to Bidford, some that have gone to Kennebunk. The then in the non-student specific special education, transportation, facilities, maintenance, system administration, insured value factor is a fancy way of saying amortization on buildings for the uh, Thornton Academy. It's a, an allowance for um, capital used in the schools, their facilities. You don't have to pay a bond to pay off their mortgage, but in addition to the tuition, there's a factor, and that's paid for in the state allocation. So you add that, and include the local revolving loan debt, and take that comes to a total of 6.7, basically 6.8 million. That's one theoretical, not necessarily ideal, but minimum cost possible Arundel alone budget. Then, I've added two things to future, but well, another thing. I'm <coughs> presuming, and again, it's not that I'm presuming, I'm using it just for illustrating purposes that. Arundel accounts for 23% of all the students. I took special education and transportation and took 23% of the RSU's total budget and say, that's Arundel. 
Now, if Arundel takes 25% to transport its students or 30% to provide special education because they got longer distances or more special needs students, that's going to be wrong. But for illustrative purposes, that's what I started with. And then I said, assume that Arundel can operate more efficiently, and for facilities maintenance and system administration, it's 15%. Now, I didn't go in and say, well, you could, somebody got up and last me and said, no way you could ever run that for 140, that you couldn't even hire a couple of people, you couldn't hire a school board. Again, I'm not saying this is a management exercise, but that's the way it would do. What I'm saying is if you were to sit down in a room and say, let's build a budget, this is one way to start looking at it and say, well, can we run it more efficiently than the per student basis? If it was 23%, it would be more expensive. In fact, that's my third option over there. But that's simply a challenge to the, to the administration. The first difference for option B, and again, this is simply to say, you think about it, can you run a, a single system on that money? I added 324000 to special education because that was the average over the last four years that Arundel used services that had the RSU not been available would have cost required um, special placement that would have cost more than was provided in the RSU budget. So if you're going to go it alone and have some risk uh, funding available for special needs students that historically have in fact required those sorts of services and it was more or less proportional to the average of the last four years, it added another 300,000, bringing the total from 6.8 to about 7.2. Again, is it real? Is it, will it happen? You just have to go through a, a, an actual budget and see. But for purposes of thinking about your choices, I thought it was a useful exercise. Then the third option, I said, is it realistic to think we could run this school, we, the citizens of Arundel, could run this school at the same and a system that oversees special education, oversees transportation, oversees um, the uh, relationship with the, the um, schools to whom the middle and high school students would be tuition, um, at less than the administrative cost of the, the system. I said, well, maybe not. Maybe a, a, we ought to consider a at least proportional to the system 23% of the total system costs, which would be directly proportional to 23% of the students. That bumps the Arundel only budget up to um, 7.5. So again, I'm not saying any of these are the answer, right answer. They're just ways to think about the choices that you face. How much risk are you willing to take? How much efficiency do you think you can um, achieve and what's the um, additional special education cost that you may might incur. Yeah, running those through the um, mill rate system, the cost per thousand for the total the, since the state contribution would be the same and the local requirement would be the same since it's the EPS applied to the very same students, very same school, very same teachers and support for teachers and, and materials and all that and the same mill rate. So all of those are the same for all three options. The only difference is the local extra and that would then run from 4.2 to 4.5 to 4.8, and the mill rate would be 1084, 1168, or 1259 under the three options. So that's simply a way of thinking about 
projections into the future. If I got to build a budget and I got to vote on what budget I think is going to be true here, let me think of some, instead of just reacting off the top of my head, let me think about a couple of options and, and see what they might be, and then which ones do I think are realistic, which ones do I think maintain the quality of education I want, and which ones um, am I willing to pay for. Um, then the next factor looking forward would be to add to that capital improvement projects that are being considered. And, and the first thing I have to say on that is every single day a capital improvement project is talked about or cost estimated, it's going to be out of date the next day. We had a lot of discussion in the last meeting about, well, there was a, a budget that was presented and I got something um, sent that was dated um, 2011. Um, you got to stop at some point and say, what do we think the costs are going to be, knowing that if you don't do it for another year, the costs are probably going to go up. Until the bond is written, you won't really know. But in order to illustrate the effects of a specified capital improvement pro program and then look at the relative effects, we could say, well, it might go from 4 million to 4.2 or from 45 to 47, but Relatively speaking, it's going to affect all of them. So, what we did was look at one, a $45 million improvement to the Kennebunk High School, a $4.2 million project for the Kennebunk Consolidated Schools, and a $4.0 million renovation to the Mildred L. Day School, and say, take that to the main bond bank, run it through their amortization, what would they have uh, decided on October 3rd, 2012, had that bond been issued, what would it have cost? And look at that in comparison. And for the Arundel alone, where debt service under the Arundel alone would be the 16,000 of the um, revolving loan that still has to be retired, plus the cost of amortizing a $4 million loan over 20 years at 3.88% for the improvement of this building, and that in fiscal um, 2015 would be, presuming that was the first year that the bond was issued and the, and the uh, first uh, amortization was required, it would be 372000 654.97 per thousand. If we then looked at the staying in the RSU, in which the entire debt service on all three projects would be borne by all three communities and allocated out under three possible different options, what would the cost to Arundel be? Under RSU A, local only, 60-40 on the three projects, the debt service, again, including the 16,000 existing uh, revolving loan, would be 715,000 in 2015. If it was the same debt, but the allocation was 90% value, 10% students, and by and large, that favors Arundel because Kenny Bunk and Kenny Bunkport have a greater valuation, and so the more the cost is distributed on the basis of valuation and the less on students, the more it would advantage uh, Arundel. So the second, running through the same system, the amortization cost is 530000 the third is 469. So obviously, if you divvy up the very same debt, and you've got it based on a 60-40 split, Arundel has 715. On a 90-10 split, it has 530. And 100-0, it's 469. Again, that's going to depend on how that decision is made. Number one, are there going to be improvements? Number two, what's the allocation going to be? But again, those are the future considerations that Arundel voters have to think about today to make that uh, decision. 
So, putting all this together then, and this is where I really think we can focus a lot of uh, attention and questions, I've put together, in effect, six options. The three Arundel alone, with the difference between A, B, and C being bare bones super efficient, bare bones super efficient, plus some special ed uh, allocation, and more or less proportional in operational efficiency to the RSU as the three Arundel alone. That's the um, 6, 8 to 7, 5 total budget. Can you operate your own system within that? And then within the RSU, where there is no total budget, it's the RSU budget that's allocated, the um, major differences are that the state contribution is going to be lower, 2.6, basically 2.7 million for the Arundel alone versus 2.8, and that's because of the way the EPS system allocates uh, tuition students to Thornton Academy at state average, whereas going to uh, Arundel, they're a higher uh, tuition rate. It's purely a question of Arundel is, is evaluated, I mean, not Arundel, uh, Thornton Academy is evaluated at state average cost. Um, the uh, the uh, RSU 21 is evaluated at their own actual submitted evaluated cost uh, determined by the state. So that Staying in, uh, going alone, you disadvantage yourselves by getting a lower EPS rate. Staying in, you get a higher um, EPS payment from the state. The local requirement is going to be the same all the way across because whatever the state mandated mill, minimum mill rate applied to whatever the value is, it doesn't make any difference what system you're in, that's the local minimum. The only difference then is going to be the local extra, both the current, what you're paying for for operations before any capital improvement, and the local um, extra debt service, which would be um, the um, totals here. It's going to be the same for the Arundel alone, since you've got 100% of the debt service on just this building and then would be the three options in the, uh, how the RSU would vote to allocate all three projects to uh, Arundel. And this presents then a range of values in terms of the ultimate cost per thousand from a low of 1180 in the bare bones, super efficient, no extra special ed, Arundel alone, to a a Rundle loan option C running from 1180 to 1356. The obviously the cheapest of the staying in the RSU would be the um, 100 zero at a cost of 1188, and the others would be in between. So, to summarize, and this is where I would say. This analysis has taken me in terms of what I think is important for the citizens of Arundel to think about is what are the odds that you can hit certain budget targets given your view of the administrative uh, efficiency, the potential of this system to operate, and what's your estimation of the likely vote on the um, capital improvement projects in the broader RSU. Um, my sense of the topics for consideration in closing are the EPS system Is it working now? Sorry. I didn't want to let you hear the conclusion. Go <laughs> see. Um, There is a systematic difference in EPS rates that is simply built into the structure of the way the state 
uh, aid is allocated. That's conclusion number one. Two, special education is an actuarial risk. It's simply a question of how much risk are you going to be willing to take in going it alone and not having the broader services of the RSU that you might have to seek at more expensive um, locations should those need, needs arise. Three, what's your ability to innovatively, at, at low cost, efficiently manage, be a superintendent, be a director of maintenance and facilities, be a director of transportation, be a um, facilities technology uh, assistant in whatever ways would be required for this building. Um, the fourth would be the concern, and this was expressed in the previous meeting, the budgetary risk to the ML Day school alone. If middle school and high school students' costs are locked in with contracts, then the only budgetary flexibility remains the elementary school. And so if there is FO, we've got to cut a budget, then the pressure is to cut it on the elementary students in this school. Um, and again, that's a risk that would be taken if the go it alone um, choice is made. And then finally, the um, going it alone does reduce the long-term capital expenditure costs to just this building as long as um, you could continue to tuition middle school and um, high school students to other places so that, and that risk itself is divided into what's the rest of the district going to do is that cost, number one, are they going to improve, approve the project, the high school consolidated and this Margaret L. Day School, and number two, if they do, how are they going to divvy it up? 60, 40, 90, 10, or 100, 0. So, to me, perhaps the uh, best way to, and, and I'll turn it back over to Todd and the committee, but uh, in some ways, the uh, list of options might be the most useful thing to focus on and, and then talk about those questions. So, um, Again, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I'd really like to turn it over to the committee and have them manage the, uh, the rest of the meeting.
curriculum or program uh, director and a special education director and um, some families to be part of time. There have to be someone filling certain positions. Yes. And then that would be the superintendent, uh, special education, um, curriculum and program, um, and transportation. Thank you. Page 12, where you talk about the uh, fiscal year 15, the one who was alone, what, what the intent of the plan is to pay off that uh, million dollar bond. In, in the withdrawal agreement, is a $131,000 payoff. So that debt would not be carried forward as a, as a standalone district. Was that number, was this? Let's say it goes from 16,429 down to 15,643. My understanding is it's the same payment all 10 years um, because it's a 0% loan. And also, I guess in the 372,654, I want to know if the 16,429 was included in that number. Yes, it is. Because um, if we're a loan, we're going to pay that debt off. So that debt would not carry beyond the fiscal year 15. Right. In this, um, and it's included in the um, section on the um, carry forward. I presume that the amortization of that revolving loan would be maintained and that there would be a distribution of the fund balance at the RSU level, uh, which nobody would know, but was estimated by the superintendent to be about two million, and that of that, Arundel would get 250000 and that that would go into the fund balance. So to keep it as comparable as possible, I presume that that debt would continue to be paid down, that 16000 annual revolving loan. Um, again, that may not be the way it actually works out. Um, materially, it wouldn't substantially affect the it, it, would, it would lower that column by about sixteen thousand dollars each year. <coughs> right. Okay. And it would reduce the rundle to a zero fund balance, as opposed to the two hundred fifty thousand that it would um, might reasonably be expected to have under the assumption of the um, distribution of those uh, obligations while maintaining payment on that debt. That, that was part of the uh, withdrawal agreement that took the longest amount of time as to how that was going to get disseminated. There's $131,000 balance that's going to be used from the undesignated fund to, to pay off the of those debts. You put into an interest-bearing account, and the payments will be taken out of that. So it won't be paid annually by a run. So if we're a standalone, that 372 or 654 should be about $16,000 less. And each subsequent year would also be approximately sixteen thousand dollars less. Is that Tom? Is that? We set up one thousand dollars. We set aside some money, and I think the two fifty that is estimated so that comes from the fund balance would be after that. Just so, but not according to what the totals are in here. But again. If that's the way that you want to manage it, that certainly would be the case. That's, that's the way it is going to be managed if we pass the plan. It's not a whether that's how we're going to. If you vote for the plan, that's how it's it, in the withdrawal agreement. That's how it's right. done. And, and what I'm saying is that that um, reduction then of that number by $16,000 um, could be take, done and, and taken out of that, that number.
is not so much a question, but I want everybody to be very clear in regards to the 60, 40, 90, 10, 100, 0. The 100, 0 was not even on the table, period. The cost sharing agreement that was not sent before the voters prior to this, even though it was requested to be, was the 9010. But that was not sent to the voters, and therefore the only allocation of how these would be done at the current moment. And I want it to be very clear because I, think we want, I don't want people to think that if you stay in the RSU that it's going to go to 9010. The only cost sharing agreement that is currently in place is a 64. That's the only thing that is in place today. I did sit on the cost sharing committee. We did put together a plan to do a 9010, but that was not sent to the voters. Nor do we know how that would end up. So the only thing that's in place today is a 60-40, and I want people to just be understanding that that is one that is currently in place. Thank you. Uh, and to <coughs> clarify that a little further, we would have to vote to stay in the RSU, vote to change the cost sharing to 90-10, then come before the voters of all three towns, and that would have to be approved in order for it to go to 90-10. I just want to say that the, the last version of the cost sharing agreement that I saw, and I agree and I would like everybody to understand that that has to be voted on by all three communities to be, to be effective. There is no vote on that at this point. But the last version of the cost sharing agreement I saw at Diane had local debt, construction debt, would be at 100 zero if that were to be, in fact, voted on and voted into place. That was corrected. I was corrected several times by several different individuals, and I received a copy of the final cost-sharing agreement that was agreed upon by the committee. That was 90-10 over EPS. <coughs> debt would have been the only thing that was considered 100% state valuation. But please do keep in mind that that is one of the risks that Chuck discusses, is there's no guarantee that that cost-sharing formula will be revised. But it is on the table. We just don't know when that would happen in the event that the stays in the RSU. That, that also requires a two-thirds majority vote of all three communities. And when that that shift would become the burden of the Mount Port. So if passing the Kennebunk Port is highly unlikely whether Kennebunk and Rundle can carry the vote or not in that case remains to be seen. If I may, I mean, I'm trying to sympathize now sympathize about something. Water. Good. There we go. Okay. I tried to I tried to boil us down to something I could understand. Very simple. If we stay in the average sheet, the big the, the, the cost will be the cost share increase. If we do not stay in the average sheet, the state allocation because we are alone would be more cost prohibitive to us. State in the average. That's really what it boils down to, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Those, those yeah. So it's, it's a question. The question is, do we want to stay in the average U and where we can and deal with any any new uh, facilities, okay? Or do we want to go it alone and understand that we're on our own and that all automatically the costs are going to increase than what they would have in the average U if we if we go it alone. Not so much the cost, but the revenue. Re revenue. Revenue. Yes. Revenue. Yes. yes. It really boils down to just those two pieces. Well, I think so we have control over some of them. We have no control over some of them. others. Correct. I would I would say that the administrative and um, uh, special, special education and uh, putting at risk the elementary school are important elements 
of budgetary consideration. They're not automatic, but there Correct. would be challenges in the go-to-loan system. That's the way I see it. I just want to add on, on time kind of a discussion that we've had debt service and construction projects are something that will also need to go out to vote to the public. Those are numbers that we're working with that are projections. There's no guarantee it could go up, it could go down, it could get voted out completely. I don't see the likelihood of that happening, but that is another unknown, another variable that we're dealing with in this very complex process. Along with the financial issues, and, and I know that there are many people in town that have this happen because I think this is one of the reasons why this was brought forth. Is not only is this just an issue of finances, but I think that this is also an issue where some people feel that they would like more say and better control over what happens within this school. So I, I don't think it's just a matter of finances. I think finances play a big part of it, but I think that there are a lot of people who would like to see that control come back within the town. Yep. 
did show that over the course of, of years, after buying out the contract, and giving all of our junior high kids choice of going to either junior high, right. that the RSU would have ultimately saved uh, a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, my understanding then is, and tell me if I'm incorrect in this, uh, that it would have been, uh, the RSC would have been starting in a more favorable position for all of these discussions um, had those two things taken place. The, the new cost sharing proposal goes much further than the previous cost sharing proposal that was rejected. In Arundel's favor? Yes. yes. Oh, that's great. A lot. The new cost sharing, not the old, not the one that was rejected. Correct. There were, there were several things in the old cost sharing that were, the, the cost sharing that was put before the voters the last time was a cost sharing on new debt only. It was not at an item 10. And along with that were a couple of clauses. There, were, there was no protection for keeping your elementary school open. There was a penalty, as a matter of fact, I believe, if you chose to keep your school open if the RSU voted to close it. Which meant that the town would have to pick up the cost of the school. Then there was, right, but he asked for clarification on what we had voted on, and I think that it's important that people understand that the cost sharing that is important, that is, that we voted on is not the same as what's up now. And then the third piece to that was is that it locked in that cost sharing so that it would not be reopened again until 2017. Okay, and my last question on this issue is just, I was a little confused about the discussion that was going on in regards to the 60-40, uh, which it is now, um, versus the proposal. I'm not exactly sure based on the, the, what Todd said, that the last thing he saw was 100-0. Um, you said that was never on the table. Um, and is that is that the number that would impact the, the table, uh, 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 the table that would? It was 90-10 DPS and 100% for, for construction projects or any kind of construction project was 100-0. So for purposes of this, which of those two would it?
I'd like to suggest that we, 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 we've got to look at the future on this. All that stuff that happened in the past has passed. I'd like us to move forward tonight. Let's not bring up all the old stuff. Because obviously, it's still very hot. They're, they're hot topics. They're hot issues. And they're not going to be productive. They're not going to be productive at all. Let's focus on where we're going and ask the questions so we can get some answers where we can make an informed decision. So let's let's come together on this and I can do this. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Lawton for taking a very difficult subject and trying to make it understandable. I'm still struggling a bit. Um, if you could just go to table 11. Yes. Um, because my thought is, is that, as you see all these people here, all the people that are at home and couldn't make it out tonight that are going to get a copy of this report are going to focus on table 11, the cost of budget alternatives. Um, my question for you, Mr. Lawton, is which of these options um, for a rundle, A, B, or C, the first three columns, is the most realistic? And I guess what I would follow up with is option A, actually even a viable option, because we do not have the, edu the special education requirements that we have historically required for the past, required for the past five years for 15 students. Can you answer that? Yes, if by reasonable you mean probability of being able to meet that cost, then I would say that option number one is a very difficult standard to meet. That is, with the odds of, if you were to put odds on meeting those, that would be low because, number one, for the reason that you say, and for no, uh, secondly, meeting the administrative requirements at the efficiency levels that are projected. I'm not saying it's reasonable or unreasonable. I'm saying it's an extremely hard target to hit. Okay, so again, for the people who weren't able to make it out tonight and who are going to read this report, you basically said option A would be difficult at best to actually achieve. So my point would be, for the people again who are not here tonight, why don't we take our left hand and cover up that first column? <laughs> because they're not real numbers, or they're not very viable. They're real numbers, sir, but they're not really a viable option statistically. So now we're left with option B, C, and then the three alternatives are staying within the district. And seeing we're not talking about quality of education, and we're not really talking about local control, but we're only talking about costs, then I hope the people in our community then would now only consider option B, C, and the three RSU options and make a decision based on that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Saul Fetter, and a lot of these numbers I probably don't really understand, but I do know one thing. I sat on the budget board for two years. And I've watched the RSU 21 dictate exactly how we were going to educate our students, where we would educate them, how we would educate them, whether or not this school would stay open or whether it would close. People are running had no say in it. And we sat and held our breaths until we found out what the budget was going to cost us every year. Now, when I first came to Arundel, I didn't know I was even in Arundel. Okay, I'm from out of state. My wife was in New England, and she was from Maine, and she drug me out of here. And I put three kids into an elementary school called Milton L. Day, and they educated those children, okay? And the strange thing about it was, you know, they were alone then. And up until two or three years ago, we were still alone. And we did a fine job. Everything wasn't perfect. But at least we had control of our children, of our school, and the direction it was going to take. Now, when we start talking about high schools and middle schools, well, we send our kids to Thornton. Okay? And Thornton has an improvement over there, which they've done a number of times. They can't look to us for a dime. 
whether it's the middle school or the high school. Okay? All we have to do is run an elementary school. And believe me, okay, I've been around these people for quite a bit. And there are all a bunch of Yankees who are pretty smart. And you can run an elementary school very well. And at this point, you know, the idea of staying in the RSU 21, okay, so that I can be dictated by another town, okay, what my kids are going to do, how they're going to be educated, I would really be against that. And none of my kids are elementary age anymore. They're in high school or they've graduated. Okay? My concern is about the people who are in this town now and want their kids educated in this school by their own people. And I think that's really the primary thing. We're not talking about a great deal of money. We're not talking about you know the, the, the good or bad of anything. We're talking about what really should happen in this community. And let me tell you, when we went to the RSU, the only reason I voted for it was because they said we had to do it or we'd be penalized. If it had been the other way, if there was no penalty, I'd have never voted for it because the school was adequate. It may have needed some improvements, but the town could have done it. How do we do this? Why? Yeah. I think I'm done since I've probably run out of time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My name is Nelson Ballou. I have lived now in Arundel for 13 years, and I'm also a math teacher at the Middle School of Penny Monks in the RSU. I do want to go back for just a minute to if we had bought out that contract, because those costs, if we decide to stay in the RSU, my understanding is even when the contract with Bowen Academy expires, middle school students will still have the choice as to whether they want to go to TAMS or not. At the time, in order to make it so that the district would make money or break even, it was, the figure that was come up with was we would need eight to 10 new students come over to middle school with penny bucks out of each class that would then be coming into sixth grade. And assuming that those ten to eight to ten students would stay through seventh, eighth, ninth, and high school, and not leave to go back, but you can't make those assumptions. But that's what we were going. The reason I became so interested in it is because I couldn't get my hands around the fact that that's all it was going to take to do it. And so I met with administrators and central office staff, and I did all of the figures out myself. And it came out eight to ten students based on tuition rates at the time. And the reason I know those are accurate, I presented them at a school board meeting with Thornton Academy people there. They did not dispute them. And I was also asked by board members, would I be willing to go and have that videotape to show the entire public if it came down to that. So I know those figures were accurate. So that's about how many would take. If more than 10 out of each incoming sixth grade class came over to the middle school of the Kenny Bunks, the district would more than have broken even on that contract. Okay, so that takes care of that one as far as I'm concerned. Now, I have two other quick comments. One of them is, you know, I, I can read the figures. Whether you're talking about revenues, whether you're talking about expenses, the overall bottom line is we entered into this process to find out whether it was estimated that staying alone would cost us more or less than staying in the RSU. Am I correct? Now, we have completed this study. I'd like a very simple answer because I think I know from what I've heard tonight. Would we cost more or less by staying alone? In your, in your opinion, because that's what people are looking to see, is what is it going to cost us, in part. Would it cost more or less, in your opinion? That I need to, it's a simple yes or no. It would cost us more or not. You're addressing that question to me? I'm addressing it, I'm addressing it, to, I'm addressing it to anyone that can give us an answer so that when we go to the polls in November, we will be educated and know how that's going to influence what we vote. 
I don't know who that person is. Would, <laughs> would, you, would you come to that conclusion if this was the school district that you lived in and we're going to be voting? <laughs> That's a difficult question, not because I don't want or can't answer it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to maintain a position here of uh, I'm working for the town as a measure of contract to advise, and I don't want to be recommending how to vote to citizens in the community. I presented what I think are reasonable <coughs> ways of thinking about the decision. That said, were I to put probabilities to this choice, I would say that the likelihood is that the costs would be greater to leave the RSU than to stay in the RSU. All right, that's good. I'll, I'll accept that. The, my other comment is, um, and I know not everybody goes by test scores and so forth, but unfortunately, since I'm a teacher, whenever it comes down to how well our school is said to be performing and other teachers doing their job, it tends to come down with if the community and the school board looks at the test scores. And unless I have missed something somewhere, since we have been in this RSU, our student performance has improved fairly dramatically. If that is the case, that they have improved fairly dramatically, and it would probably cost us less to stay in, I don't have to read between the lines. It is true that the tuition costs a total of the two, 2.64 million for middle and high school tuition are fixed. They're locked in. You can't do a thing about them. You have no control of those dollars. You simply write a check. Mildred Day's 1.57 million is about 80% salary and benefits. There isn't any wiggle room in that country and, and those costs either. For all practical purposes, they are fixed. And for the last three years, via the RSU budgets, we've been whittling away at all six schools and have cut costs very drastically just in order to keep all the people that we have now. And isn't it also true that on, on the 15% uh, assumption for 
for facilities costs. Okay. If you're going to get from 23 down to 15, turn out the lights, turn off the heat, fire the two people who are custodians. Those are the choices. Question mark? Just kidding. I hope you don't have to come to that. So the system administration, on the other hand, uh, requires the following functions. And, and uh, you estimated them initially at the low end of 148,000. That would require that the yeah, question we would say that. The, the question was uh, what comprises those costs? You've got a superintendent, part time, superintendent's assistant, full time, part time bookkeeper, special ed director who's going to be full time by law. Central office expenses, school board expenses, legal contingency, auditing services, insurance, an IT specialist, pure servers that don't exist now, and annual software licenses. That's our, our very costly. My guess is <coughs> the cost is upwards of 300 to 350 k. That not a fairly reasonable estimate? Yes, I follow you on that would be a very reasonable estimate. Again, this was option, all of these options were variations on the proportional to the RSU cost or not, as well as <coughs> illustrating the challenge of leaving the RSU. I was not. And it's not my position to try to manage or structure a school or to go through and build a budget up from the bottom. Mine was to try to illustrate the fiscal implications. And I agree that 15% was simply a way of saying, if you want to look at a super efficient, super lean option, that's one way of going about it. I didn't try to construct that, and that's why I say that in probability terms, that's a stretch. It's there not because I think it's an option to have to consider it, but that I that I built it up with a personnel staff in mind. I used it as an illustration, the same as I did the um, special ed education based on experiences of the past and the 23% based on simply the proportional share of students. None of them were based on going in and trying to say how much does a principal make or assistant principal or IT director. That's a management um, task that is beyond the scope of this project. Thank you. I think I heard that the costs are likely to be higher than lower. Between the 15 and 23. Uh, moving quickly to table eight. Uh, we managed the spend costs. Uh, how, how confident are you that those costs really need to be in any viable budget? Well, to the extent that they were actual students receiving services through the RSU over the past four years, they're a reflection of history. The cost of alternative placement, the 734000 or the, the difference there of 324 is actual based upon quotes obtained by the special ed directors. So uh, assuming they do need it to be in the budget, and most of the other costs in the budget are fixed and not controllable, there isn't any real room to take other costs out of the budget. Is that the essence of it? I think the, the essence of it was that it's a variable cost that 
is going to be different year to year and that would be substantially greater if the only avenue of service was a non-RSU placement. Thank you. Table 7. We estimated that the annual increase in cost of going and loan and design is in the range of $1.81.
contracted out to teachers. So what we are local control, what our local control is, it ends up being that little portion that is programming and staffing. So frankly, I don't want to have that all on, my, on our shoulders. I want to be able to look at six schools and cut paper budgets if I have to instead of Spanish. I want to be able to combine services like copying so that we can still have RTI and be in compliance with the state, which we were not before. And frankly, adequate education, that's not in my vocabulary. Stellar education is, and we have stellar education right now, at a deal. And if you guys are looking at these tables like I am, it's cheaper to be in the RSU, it's better for our kids to be in the RSU, it's better for our facility to be in the RSU, and I feel really frustrated that we've been led down this path so long, and our children are suffering, and I just, I sat in meetings with the, the Arundel School Board prior to being in the RSU. I sat in the RSU meetings. I was on the RSU board. I, I can't sit through another meeting of whether we're going to raise the price of milk so that we can have enough money in our cafeteria. I don't want to sit through another meeting where we talk about whether or not we need to cut books from first grade so that we can have enough for the fifth grade. It's not okay. We don't have to do that right now. And it's not fair to, to make our kindergarten through fifth grade pay the price for our sixth through twelfth graders. They will have that choice to go to TAMS. They will have that choice to go to TA. They will also have a choice to go to MSK. They will also have a choice to go to Kenny Buck High School. And gosh darn it, doesn't that sound like everybody gets what they want and our kindergarten through fifth grade ends up with a stellar education and we don't have to keep stealing from them to pay for our older children. And that's all I have to say about this. Um, it's been brought up before that it's, 
and in Arundo as part of our issue 21, we were able to say that our kids have, have great opportunities for learning, and good facilities, good teachers, inspired administrators in the program. Uh, the test scores have gone up as we commented before. If we pull up and make the one decision, we lose probably most of that. But more importantly, perhaps for those of us who don't have kids in school, is how does the school affect you? I'll put to you that property values increase as more people desire to live within a particular school district or town. Families and children are willing to pay more to live in a community with good schools. Home buyers who plan in, even home buyers who plan on using private schools for those without children, like me, benefit from communities with strong schools. As long as a community maintains high quality public schools, then property values will be more likely to rise. When a school district, school, a school district cannot adequately fund their schools or otherwise fail to value the education of its children, then school quality will decline. Great teachers and administrators will go elsewhere. Great students will go with their families to other towns. ML Day test scores will drop back to where they were before. Arundel will develop a reputation as a second level town in the And our community will see new businesses and home buyers choosing to live elsewhere. And what will be the result? The result, of, the result will be our real estate value will decrease. What for most of us is our largest single financial asset will suffer. Even if you don't plan on selling your property soon, at some time your heirs probably will. So if you care about the value of your home in Arundel, go for it. Staying in Irish Street 21 makes good real estate sense. Thank you. I didn't go through that process several years ago when that was all negotiated, but that would be 
a discussion with other communities in the area, as happened in the past, to find someone that was willing to accept our students. Now, to that point, we, there is a letter of commitment from Thornton Academy that states that they are willing to extend that contract should that opportunity arise. But that's a letter of commitment. That is, a, that would go once again to vote to ratify a contract if it were decided to be negotiated. And I guess the opportunities are, <clears throat> are wide open should, should Thornton Academy not come through on that deal. But right now, we have, right now, we have can have the middle school in Canada that, that's there. It's there, we just can't use it. <laughs> Jim, Jim, to further that, that answer, should we stay in the RSU and the Thornton Academy middle school contract not be renewed by the RSU, our middle school students for the state would have middle school choice of the two middle schools, came out the fourth one. And, and that's, I mean, that would be the case even if Thornton, I mean, it's a contract. And it's like any contract, it doesn't have, one side or the other can decide not to renew it. Right. So Thornton Academy, even if we wanted to stay there, and Thornton Academy said, no, we don't want to, we need the space for high school students or whatever else they might want the space for. That opportunity is gone. We're back. We're back to square one when they run around looking for another school to send them to, or we're paying to build their own. Or if we stay in the Irish, you they build a middle school that came up. That, that's my point. Yep. <laughs> well, Academy has made it very clear that they're interested in, in keeping the rural kids and they'd like to have all the rural kids for as long as the rural kids want.
that it has for RSU 21 and therefore applies rates close to the state average of students attending TA. TA's actual program details submitted to the state for EPS analysis, real EPS rates be calculated. It almost certainly be higher than the state's average, thus diminishing and perhaps erasing. So does that mean that, that because the state doesn't have what what's available from TA, that, that we're at a disadvantage even now? Because they're applying the state averages rather than actual? So that's the reason for that differential. And it's, it's not because it's not available, it's not submitted to the state in the same way that other systems, the, the programs, the teachers, the salaries, the um, budget, so that it can be run through the EPS system, evaluated by the EPS uh, formula. So if, if, as a standalone, there's a question as to whether or not that 151 would be accurate, would that translate to a question as to whether or not we're being reimbursed under the current EPS as part of the RSU 21 if we don't have that detail? I mean, if we don't have the detail and we're using an average, then that is applied whether you're standalone or not, correct? No. Well, the difference is that in, within the RSU, the state EPS is calculated based on the, in, in, in the secondary school example, based on um, the data provided for Kennebunk High School. That data produces a higher state EPS allocation and therefore a rate that's reimbursed than would be applied to North Academy were Arundel alone. So the difference is, because Arundel is within the RSU, it's getting an EPS reimbursement that's higher than it would get if it was alone. It's still paying the same tuition. On the revenue side, you're paying Thornton Academy the same amount either way. The state is covering more of it because when you're in the RSU, the state covers more of it than if you were alone. Okay, still confusing, but I'll move on. Um, so one of the notes that I wrote down as you were talking about table seven, the different options, A, B, and C, um, I wrote down option A was a uh, high degree of, of efficiency. And thanks to technology, I was able to quickly Google um, the study of Maine's more efficient public schools. It was uh, done in January 2012 prepared by the Maine Education Policy Research Institute of the University of Southern Maine. And only 17% of the schools in the state of Maine are qualified as more efficient, not even highly efficient. So again, when you were put on the spot to say, what is the likelihood of that? You answered it's low. I would say that it's practically impossible something that you could certainly strive for, but it's not going to happen in the town of Arundel next year, the year after, or probably ever if we're a standalone. Which brings me back to table 11. And again, I guess maybe it was um, going through this and, and, and just listening to um, how you, how you answered the question when you were put on the spot as to what is your real feeling, that it seems like we've got all these different options and, and really one is like pie in the sky and isn't really ever going to be attainable in the town of Rundle. Um, so I'm not sure why it's there. I guess unless it's to, you know, show if you strip everything out of the school system, you could technically run for a little bit of money. A little bit less than if we stayed in, but I, I don't think, given given what we're after, I don't think that that's applicable. Given that the expert that we hired really doesn't think that it's an option, I just don't. I'm not sure why it's in there. Now, yes, I think, yes. I think the reason where I see that value is that the tax base said we only want to rank eleven dollars and eight cents. What do you want to get? 
Yeah, but it doesn't tell you what you're going to get. But, but it gives you a clue. It gives you a bare bones. And I agree. But then, oh, but number one doesn't even address special education costs? I'm telling you. $11.80 for them to get just bare bones. So option 8 is not included? Oh, no. There's a million three. For education in option A. And again, to address the question of what I was doing, it, 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 it's, it's sort of the uh, giving a fish or teaching a fishing. Uh, the, if there's been an active discussion, in part because of option A, then it's been worthwhile to have it in there if only to throw it out. But the, uh, <laughs> the point is to stimulate thinking about all of these things, control, quality, and cost, with something more specific than just those words, but with some numbers on the page. And I think there's been a certain amount of learning going on just debating these numbers here this evening that, in my view, make it worthwhile to present them. Now, what the odds of one being achievable is a second level of analysis that I think is ultimately the, the one that we're making here tonight and that is evolving through the discussion. The analysis that I made that supported your opinion, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, that's really, I mean, again, this is that thing where, you know, as a resident taxpayer, you know, we voted to spend money with you mm -hmm. to cut through the BS and, and, and figure it out. And as I read through this report, not only is there so much information and it twists you and turns you, it just seems like this BS. Now, the one thing that I, that I noticed was that um, the majority of your conclusions stayed the same from the original presentation back on, dated October 2nd. I don't know if that was the actual date it was presented, but that was the date of the draft. Um, and that the um, special education, essentially leaving the IRC would put taxpayers or run at greater risk of budgetary fluctuations because of variability and expense of education. Um, that it's going to be, you know, an administrative challenge to try and do it on our own. Um, you know, it's been men mentioned many times over the last few years, the Arundel-only system exposes ML Day to the pressures, and uh, you can pretty much talk to any parent that had children here, you know, prior to consolidation. And although we didn't necessarily see it while we were here, and, and while you were here, and your kids were here, when you compare it, to what, what there is now, that's when the light goes on. Um, which leads me to number five, and kind of going back to that thing that just seems to like keep coming up, where it's just, you know, you, you seem like you've got the track, and then you throw in something about, well, you could eliminate um, building repairs, and then you've got some numbers in here, but that's only like a small part of the story, because you know, if I read your, your summary number five here correctly, you're using strictly the building renovations numbers, but, but nowhere else is offsetting that with the delivering of education numbers. So, so again, that seems pretty confusing. Um, but I wanted to go back to number one, because this one kind of confused me the most. Um, and that the educational finance system pays for students differently based on what school unit they're in. I don't know if that's necessarily a conclusion or if that should have been part of the data that came up with the other four conclusions. But, but since it's here, still confused, um, it says that in effect the Rundle pays $15 extra for each student and set to Thornton. Is that strictly by EPS formula, or does that take into consideration the space and the availability and the room at in the other RSU 21 schools? So that essentially, rather than uh, you know, we did a lot of study early on about when we were trying to buying up for the academy contract, it was determined that essentially the RSU up to a certain number could bring in 
students for relatively, you know, the cost of maybe the lunch and books because the seat's there, the teacher's there, all that's there. And, and we were talking huge savings by doing that. But as I read this here, it gives you the impression that, you know, really it's, it's only a savings of $15. So is this strictly EPS or is this, you know, budgetary help? This is strictly EPS. This is the fact that Arundel alone from the Department of Education's evaluation would get EPS um, reimbursement at 6961 versus in the RSU, 6976 That's not a big difference, but that's the per student amount that the state would provide. And for secondary students, that difference is 6911 versus 7340. Again, this has nothing to do with what you pay for um, tuition or what it costs to run the program in the school. It's what the state, based on an EPS formula, applied in one case to the actuality of RSU 21, its teachers, its students, its operations, versus instead of the actuality of Thornton Academy, a state average, because they don't have the actuality of Thornton Academy, and by applying that state average number, those differences arise. It's purely, it's like thinking of having two different insurance companies who pay different amounts for the same operation that you have. It has nothing to do with the operation, it has nothing to do with you, it has to do with what the system that finances it pays through one insurance company versus another. So that $15 is essentially what, what, what it's saying is that for every student that goes to Thornton, the state, the state is going to give us $15 less. So that doesn't really take into consideration the savings for the students that go to MSK if we continue to be part of the district. Well, what it would say is that for every student that ceased to go to um, Thorn Academy Middle School and went instead to Kennebunk Middle School or the Middle School of the Kennebunk, there would be a $15 additional state EPS allocation for each one of those students. Okay. Again, I guess maybe because it's it's kind of in the conclusion section. I think it, it, it's not, um, I just think it's confusing because it makes it look like really it's only going to cost you $15 more if we stay alone, but I think we've seen enough studies that say that the savings, once they actually get into the system, is, is much greater. Um, which brings me to the, um, the phrase that's in this conclusion and future considerations that I think really hit me the wrong way is that it says, in the future, a standalone contract with TA eliminated this possibility to run the bare cost of $21,000. Why is that in there? Where did that come from? And, and why would you as an independent start looking at, uh, given you know, a charge of in or out, why would, why would there anything be in here that has anything to do with essentially eliminating choice by a contract? Why, why would that be in there? And if that would be in there, then why wouldn't we turn that the other way around and look at what would happen if something happened with the legislature, whether the Thornton Academy said we don't want to bring the kids anymore, whatever the case may be, but to put those numbers all within the RSC. Maybe you don't have the history and the, and the, the background information about the choice blocking contract. That's been a pretty hot topic around here. So, so to see that mentioned in the conclusions and considerations to somehow give somebody hope that that might happen, I, I just I don't think it's appropriate um, in that spot. Um, so I guess in closing, two things. Local control, 
sorry to mention, we don't have any control over the contracts that we have. Diane, I'd like to thank you for trying to help control what's in the best interest for the town of Rundle by moving the cost sharing formula forward. It's quite unfortunate that our other two elected members chose not to vote to put that forward, given the amount of money that is at stake for the town of Rundle. Uh, and that's just an absolute shame. So when you start thinking about control, think about the people you put in office, because that's where the control is. And when we have people who, for whatever their reason may be, don't vote for what is clearly in the best interest of the town of Arundel, then control really doesn't make a difference. Thank you.
summary reports mailed out quickly enough. Unfortunately, or well, fortunately, but unfortunately, the, pay, the, the document's 17 pages long and I couldn't, the town couldn't mail it to each individual residence. The post office has a limit on how heavy our bulk mailing can be um, with our no, I, think, I think it's a good idea for a summary. But it's yes, I'm working on a summary. Uh, Chuck has provided me summary tables and a summary of this document that we're going to get dates on and mail to the residents. Um, anybody has any questions at any time, they can feel free to call me. Please direct people to go to the website. I've been updating it as regularly as I can. Um, and as I said, I'm attempting, and even if I have to break it into several sections, tonight's public hearing will be on the website for people to view. And I, I, I assume I know what no, that was it. And it is me, the Todd that keeps bringing it up. So. Mr. Watt, when you went for cost uh, for new debt for renovations at ML Bay, um, and you went for a level loan, what uh, percentage of the bond did you use for a figure for that? What, 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 what bond? What was the number? Um, Four million dollars. No, yeah, percent. So. Uh, interest. 3.88. Um, is that a viable uh, bond that a bundle would be uh, able to get? Yes, I'll answer that question. The town of Rundle has absolutely no debt and enough of an undesignated fund balance that we would most certainly qualify for that. Because I did hear something different on the ratings on, on that percentage. Um, all right. The a bundle has been a very big issue. It's pitted family against each other, causing some families to move or to move from a bundle. The divide, in my opinion, is about middle school. Years, uh, years ago, a 10-year agreement with Gordon was drawn up in order for a bundle to meet state requirements. That agreement has seemed to satisfy some Arundel families, but not all. Staying in RSU 21 after the year 2016, we will have choice. Uh, Arundel families will get to choose whether to send their 6th to 8th graders to PAMS or a middle school of the Kenny Hawks. Staying in RSU 21 gives Arundel the opportunity to stay in a fantastic school system while allowing Arundel to choose which middle school better suits their family, thus starting to heal the divide in this town. choice bill had, 
has not passed. Not the choice bill. This is there, there's there's a separate uh, piece of legislation. My understanding was that it, that it had passed. It just and all it did was prevent uh, towns from entering into restrictive uh, uh, contracts. We see your question. I think is that we were to withdraw. Yep. We had an elected school board to make some decisions about how we move forward with those schools and other requirements, and ultimately that changes whether you have an exclusive contract with any of the school system to be local that you've got to pay for. Okay, so if, but if, if we if we stay with the RSU, we will definitely have you have a choice. Choice right. in 2016. That's the legislation says that. Right, but if we leave, then we may or may not have a choice based on what the what the school board decides and what the taxpayers decide. The school board recommends the school board decide. Correct. Okay, but we would uh, if we were to have be a be a restricted contract, we can't we would lose that middle school international baccalaureate program. Unless we're standing down. You wouldn't be able to attend. Thank you. Hi, my name is Scout Wordner. I'm a resident of Rondo and I have three children that have attended Mildred all day. I guess I just want to comment on Rondo going in on its own. Um, prior to the RSU, this school was a mess. Uh, we had, I was married to a school board member and a volunteer. There were water filtration problems, arsenic problems in the water, water pump issues, broken water fountains, leaky pipes, parking lot issues, boiler issues, separate heating systems. At one point I had a friend up from Connecticut, this is a great story, and I brought him to the playground that my wife had just helped design everything. I was pretty proud that she did a good job on it. And he asked me how long the school had been closed. I was a little embarrassed to tell him that that's where my kids go to school. Um, since the RSU has started, just look around. I mean, the buildings look good. There's energy in the school. The entranceway looks good. The bushes have been pruned. The lawn gets mowed. I used to mow the lawn here in the summer. Um, and my kids are going to be all out of the school, so I can't do it anymore. Um, and just the quality of leadership. I guess in closing, I'd just like to say that I'd like to thank the RSU for giving us Dr. Brown. Thank you.
70 percent of those tax dollars to go to education. What are you getting for that dollar? Have you ever asked yourself that? Or are you just ready to try to bear the pain? If your house is valued a couple hundred thousand, fourteen hundred dollars of it is going to education taxes. Another question. What are we receiving for our hard-earned money? Let, let me talk about scores. We've been on a variety of statements tonight, but nothing specific. We've talked about lower scores before and better scores now. Looking at specifically at Builder Day, over the past decade, the last decade, the scores Older day compared with 300 other elementary K-5 schools in this state. We're in the bottom 20-40% of all during the decade. In the last three years since the RSC took over, uh, the scores are way above state average now. And in fact, the fifth graders this past year their test scores were well up in the top 10% reading and in the top 20% in math. That's fabulous. And, you know, how can we even consider walking away from that? The point was made earlier, too, uh, about the savings of the kids that moved during the arbitration process. There were a dozen kids that moved to MSK. Many of them are now in high school. Even, even though it was necessary to pay for them not to go to TAMS, uh, if you look at the savings over their careers at MSK, assuming they go to Kenmont High School, RSU is saving a quarter of a million dollars in spite of all those costs and illegal fees uh, just for those dozen kids alone. Just an aside. One of, one of, another question is, what are the long-term implications for these children and us as citizens and property owners? We've talked about that from a property owner standpoint. You look over the next 20 years, there are about a thousand kids that will move through this school next 20 years, they're competing with 13,000 other kids per year, per grade, at their own grade level. Pretty soon they get out of high school, and they've got to compete. How well prepared will they be? I really need to think about it, even though you may not have kids in school. Finally, uh, here's another question. Is there a potential solution that will provide lower costs, give kids a great education wherever they want to go, and heal the town's roof? How do we find a win-win solution? I am not sure there is one. Let's let's really continue the process, have our discussions, and find a good solution. Thank you.
It was a small town and everyone knew each other. When we needed something, parents got together and they made it happen. We were a proud, hardworking community. And I can honestly say that proud is not a descriptive of views described by community today. Today, we have neighbors who your neighbor with disrespect because they see things differently. The type of politics that has taken place in this town is nothing to be proud of. So we consolidated with Kenny Bunks, and before we give it the smallest chance, we want out. We start a campaign scaring the community about the cost if we stay, not at all considering the cost if we leave. I agree, because I knew without the numbers, this town would never start healing, and I was deeply concerned about the community. The numbers are out, and now it's clear. Even with the renovations to the Kenny Mountain High School, we are financially disadvantaged if we leave the RSU. And what is so disappointing about the whole thing is that this study and withdrawal agreement does not address or guarantee any quality of education. No committee or company was tasked with actually creating a forecasted budget that budget based on what our K-5 students receive today. The numbers that are used do not guarantee the same quality of education and administrative system and will not. Another disappointment is our plan for uh, upon withdrawal um, is to contract special contract out special education. Um, we're just gambling special education, and I just can't imagine why we would even consider it. Um, so we still want to withdraw because we really don't care that it costs us more. We really don't care about the quality of education. It's because we want local control. Is it worth giving up quality education so we can, can we have local control? Can somebody actually tell me what local control means? Because I haven't quite figured it out. Currently, we have three members on the school board of the RSU, which gives us say in the education of our students, K through five, and nine, some of our nine through 12 students, and no say in our six through eight. If we withdraw, we have no control over our nine through 12, no control over our six through eight, unless you consider having the ability to resign a contract with TAM's control. So that leaves K through five. We will have K through five that according to these numbers will not have a website, will not have email, will not have any type of bookkeeping system, and certainly will not be prepared for any type of variable factors. A rental historically goes to save tax dollars. As time goes by, the school will be neglected. Teachers will receive less and less support. No state-of-the-art equipment, technology, software, where will be provided for our staff and for students. Parental communication will fall. We will go backwards so that we will have local control. Local control will put us at risk of losing MLT because we can no longer maintain it. At that point, we will contract out K-5 and we will have no control and no community. Please consider what you are risking. A run that cannot maintain a quality education system on our own. Consolidating with the Kennedy Bunks has been the best thing to have in the school system since the last addition to the building took place over 35 years ago. Thank you.
but the bulk of the teachers are the same teachers. The education, and I'm going to use your phrase, is stellar today, and it is stellar before. No. That's not true. I disagree. Well, the scores, the scores don't disagree. I, uh, I didn't, I didn't enjoy you, Bob. I appreciate it. Test scores are test scores. Um, and I can tell you from a sister of mine who has 40 years retired this year, who barely passed her SATs, has a master's degree in education, and who always tested for it. I have a son who tests for it, who was an A B student throughout his high school and college career. So test scores are test scores. And are there ways to make test scores? Change? Absolutely. Can we focus on it? Probably not. Should we? Probably so. But it's this community that can make that difference. It doesn't have to come from the community. We can do that all right here. Right now, into the future, as we did before. And if we didn't do it, it's our own fault. Shame on us. Hello, my name is uh, Jane Newby, and I have um, been a resident of Arundel for about 20 years or so, no, 20, 23 years, I guess. Um, back when my daughter first started at Arundel all day, she had, um, she did a wonderful teacher, she had Bev Lowell uh, for her kindergarten and uh, first grade. She had it for two years in a row, which was wonderful. Um, but Bev was, she was a very experienced teacher, but because Arundel was in a very limited situation. She had to teach 25 children without any additional support. I was one of the um, parent volunteers and she managed that really well. Um, but, and, you know, so there, there were no teacher aides at that point. But as Gwendolyn went through into her first grade, second grade, and into third grade, the enrollment continued to increase. So she went from having, you know, 25 kids up to 27 kids in her class, and you could tell more in that classroom, you know, there were two classes of 27 each, that the kids were having a harder time getting their needs met. And um, we had voted in a meeting at the middle of the day that that class would get split the next year into three classes so some of those needs could get met for the children. Um, when third grade rolled around, um, that didn't happen, even though the town voted in a school board meeting because the special aid, uh, special needs um, had increased. And so the classroom, what I was told when it didn't happen was the classroom had to be given away to special education. And so therefore we continued on with this overcrowding and the needs of these 54 children were not met. And so I'm very concerned that if we, if we leave the RSU and we risk um, things like this happening in the past that all of a sudden we have an increase in special needs um, education that is mandated by the state, then even if we voted in the town to possibly split a class up into three groups instead of two that are overcrowded, that those situations, we might want them to happen, but the budget is just not there. And we, again, it becomes a matter of all the pressure being put on the K through five and there's no flexibility and it really does impact our younger education which is such a critical time in our children's lives. So I'd like that to be, um, be thought about. the other night, why does Riley have more opportunities than I did? 
Okay, she said it a little bit more rough, but the point was there, and um, she didn't have Spanish. She was never taken out to get assessed for RTI. She never had, well, that wasn't like a good choice, but, but some of the gifted and talented things that have been happening, none of those things were available. Um, and I was involved a whole lot more when my daughter was younger, because I only had one, but I remember being on the PTA and being, watching the teachers come and ask for money because they didn't have it in the budget. They were asking for printers, they were asking for paper, they asked for all sorts of things, tape recorders. They didn't have some basic, basic supplies. And that was because the zero mill rate was the status quo. You can't protect this school if you're not going, by standing alone, you can't protect it. You have to spread that cost out. The K through five can't take that kind of hit. It just doesn't make sense to me that you would put those kids at risk. My son deserves the same amount of money as my daughter does as a high schooler. Well, you know what I mean. I mean, you, you want to have her, his money be the same, that he gets the same value in his school as my daughter gets as a contracted high school student. It's not fair that he should suffer because we've dwindled the budget down to such a thing that, that he's not going to have supplies. And I will totally support that the teachers were all the same. Both my kids have had the same teachers. But there is a captain driving our ship right now, people. Dr. Crowley, God bless you.
has sacrificed over a million dollars in purchases of fire trucks and apparatus that we're behind, that we haven't budgeted for, we haven't set the money aside for, and we don't have in this town to protect the people that live here. Why? It's a big budget item number. It's easy to, to continue to duck it every year. Instead, we just put 50 grand a year aside, and they struggle to try to put together enough money to get another ambulance. Meanwhile, we as the budget board stand around looking at how are we going to recoup money from the people that are injured in a car accident to try and see if they, maybe we can go after their insurance company. You know, it's just ridiculous. So I will put out, and I am guilty of this as being uh, you know, the vice chair of the budget board, you know, what is the thing that got cut this year? The big hoopla. You want to talk about local control? The budget board couldn't figure out what the value was of a $10,000 uh, you know, expenditure. And then the, the selectmen, you know, in all their infinite uh, you know, wisdom and capacity, couldn't figure out the value of a $10,000 expenditure. And what was it that we didn't fund? Library. Education. meeting going on. Um, I'm Jim Buderaz, I've been a um, resident for going on 20 years, my own uncle. Um, but I, what I want to get to is there's been a lot of interesting, dynamic information shared tonight. And everyone here has their own opinion on what's best for the world. And that's every single person's right. And that's, that's what we're all about, it's having choice and what we want for our town. That's why we're all sitting here. My point of coming up here right now is trying to, trying to understand how is this going to be presented in the vote. It's, it's supposed to be being voted on during the, during the election, right? November? So if that's the case, what I want to try to understand is right now, Table 11 on this cost budget alternatives. If this was presented as is to the residents, and I agree that everyone needs to educate themselves on what exactly all this means. And I'm sure everyone in this room now has a really good understanding of what, what all goes into this. And you guys have done a great job putting it together. And I am concerned about when it goes to vote, a lot of people are going to look at this and not really understand what's going on. What I what I want to hear from you guys is how is it going to be presented? Because right now, as far as I'm concerned, option one, option five, and option six are really not reasonable or realistic for people to be considering. And to be looking at trying to make a, a judgment point on what they want to happen. I mean really it's simply going to be coming down to a couple of these that are realistic choices. How, what are the next steps in how it's going to be presented to the residents so that we can make, you know, the decision we each individually want to make and for the people that are a little bit, a little bit less educated that weren't here tonight, how are we going to present it so it's understandable and they can make a choice? Because they will make a choice because they're going to vote even if they know what they want and I'm sorry, man. Finish your talk, I'm done. Um, it will be presented in the voting booth as a question. Do you favor the withdrawal of the town of Arundel from Regional School, school Unit 21, yes or no? Unfortunately, that, that's how it's asked. Yeah. And how we present it, and I, I, once again, I'm going to be blunt, we mail the postcard to every single vote, every single resident of this town, every single one. Got a postcard letting you know there's a meeting tonight. And I counted, we had 89 people here. 89 people. So I put it on the website, and I can't, I can't track how many people are going to the website to look at this. People that come to town hall and ask, we hand them this. If they have questions, I can step 250 feet away from the building right now and discuss it with them. But that is how we're trying to get this. Tonight's public hearing will be posted on the website. I agree, everybody doesn't go to the website but the people who do come into town hall, 
do ask questions, do get the information. There will be additional meetings set, but I can almost guarantee you with great certainty, I wasn't thinking certainty, I was thinking great disappointment. That I can almost guarantee you that those other meetings will get even less than 89 people in the room. And that is a very difficult thing in a community that's in a position such as this. Because what I hear when I'm out on the street, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ramble on here for a minute, but what I hear when I'm out on the street in a rumble is how angry people are that there's no information available. How angry people are that they don't know what they're voting on. And then there's 89 people here at this meeting. Last night I, I made a joke at the selectmen's meeting and I said, I'm going to make 100 copies of this report, and I can almost guarantee you I'll have too many. I made 150 because I was hopeful, and there'll be 50 or 60 still sitting on that table. So we, I do what I can in my capacity as town manager and how I know to try to give this information to people, and they don't turn out. So I don't know that. It's really difficult for me. Um, Tom put it very well the other night, and I hate to put you on the spot, Tom, but he said, if I told you who to vote for for president, would you listen to me? And people laughed and that's all. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, people come to me, and I, I, both sides, I think I've been frustratingly to people middle of the road here. Um, and I don't know how to get those people, because people are going to go into the voting booth not knowing, just listening to what their neighbor said, and listening to what the guy that knocked on their door said is true, and they take that for fact. So if anybody knows of any, in, any way to get that information out to people better than we're doing now, let me know. I mean, I, I would greatly appreciate that. One comment that I will make to the people who are remaining in the room is I did, I don't have the institutional knowledge. I hope someday you say I've been in the room long enough to have that institutional knowledge. But I did some research in the last town meeting warrant that I could find, um, which was before we joined the RSU. System administration was approved and appropriated at $142,500. So that was 36 plus months ago. So I just want to, you know, lend credence to the to what. People have been kind of beating around the bushes. I don't think that we can do it for that option A. And there are a lot of unknowns, and it's a very tough decision. And I wish I could tell people how to vote, but I can't. <laughs> it's an ethical issue that you have as a town manager. I wish I could say to you, hey, listen to me, vote this way. And you can't do that because people have a different perspective on this whole issue. Whatever their perspective is, they have a right to do that. So if anybody can help us to get the information out there, I'd greatly appreciate it because I've been trying everything I know how to do to get that there. Right. Bob, I just want to say thank you for putting the numbers together because this is what we're after as far as trying to understand, you know, what are the pros and cons of doing this. So the information has really helped me personally try to try to figure out which way I'm gonna vote. Because coming in here, before I saw the numbers, I, I'm really truly on the fence. I'm sure people think I'm thinking one way or the other. I wanted to see the numbers. And that's hopefully what everyone's considering is, is the education and the numbers together. So thank you very much. Very bad. 
budget. Uh, and generally, you'll see two recommendations, one from the budget board, one from the selectmen. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. But I think that on this issue, the members of the board of selectmen, and if you want to ask them individually how they feel about this, um, that would be one thing. But I think that as a recommendation, um, it's not fair if we feel differently on the subject to ask us to vote to either approve or disapprove even on the article. Thank you, Bella. Uh, Mr. Kumarazzi's uh, question. We as a board of selectmen decided we were going to go to the community and it's twice within the next week and a half. We're going to go to Dutch Elm and, and down to uh, the boat, boat yard uh, two different times of the day. We have accepted the responsibility. That's why we, we went, that's why we encouraged the withdrawal process. Uh, so, you know, I can't think of the rest of it. I can tell you that I wanted the people to be able to make an informed decision, and I think we have the information to make that informed decision. Now it's up to us, it's our responsibility, and your responsibility, to go to people and say, attend these meetings. Get to those meetings, okay, which I will post, be there, ask, ask the questions, get the answers you're looking for. It is our responsibility, we accepted this last night, that we have to be as well informed as Chuck can make us, and I think he's done an excellent job tonight, because I think there's a lot of very informed people out there as well. You are very, very well informed of what this document says. Now it's up to us to communicate what those options are and what they aren't, okay? So people can make an informed decision. I personally am in favor of leaving option one in it because it shows absolutely worst, excuse me, worst case. I have no problem leaving any of those six because it's going to take an explanation for people to understand how those how those came about and what they really mean. But it's our responsibility, and it's your responsibility, to get people to those meetings. That's why we're going from one end of the town to the other end of the town within the next week before the election to make sure that we can communicate this as best that we can for people who don't understand. But it's your responsibility as well. Thank you. One of the other things that I want to point out, and, and Todd had mentioned it before, that we have media here. You know, we had, we had uh, two television stations, and we've got the General Tribune, we've got the, the, the uh, right. And, you know, that stuff is getting out. It's getting out a lot more than if they weren't here. So, I mean, that's part of, we want to get the word out to everybody. We're, we're using the, the website, we're using the media trying to do everything that we can to get as much information out. And once again, only less than 100 people show up in the town of 4,000. You know, we're asking you folks to get all the other folks engaged. My name is Steve Hayes. I've been a resident of Orlando for 20-something uh, years. Uh, I have a question for, um, I'm sorry, the gentleman that we hired to do the study for us. Um, uh, in your option A on the table 11 there, you kind of created it by doing the bare bones administration piece, which I think you said you did at 15%. Yes. And the option uh, 3 on the standalone was, I think you said 23%, which was the same portion of administrative costs that is being used by the RSC at this moment, is that correct? Correct. I guess my question is, if you work on their economy of scale, and generally you think by having a bigger unit of organization, you can operate things more efficiently, why did you come up with a option that was less than the current 23%, and why, or why also is not there one, a more possibly probable one, which would be higher um, percentage in the smaller unit to try to manage those costs. It, to me, it seems like it might be more likely that it's going to increase, less likely that it's going to decrease. You've given us two on the decrease and one at the same. So, what was your thinking on that? Well, the first was the first thought was to 
answer the question, could we do it alone or cheaply? How could that be achieved? And the answer is by the reverse of a diseconomy of scale in administrative efficiency and not providing emergency money for unforeseen special education needs. So it was an extreme case to illustrate the question, in order to be less expensive, what would we have to achieve? In other words, if this was a committee setting out to establish a budget, we say, well, what's the low and what's the high? What would we have to do to hit the low? And that's the, the rationale, if there is one, for the first option. The reason for not going 28, 30, 35 percent was that the expense at the even proportion was substantially higher than in the RSU. And one could, you could draw your own conclusions going further that, that it didn't seem to shed any additional light on the consideration. Okay, thank you. Um, so following up that question, I was thinking of the historical data on what percentage administrative costs had been prior to the RSU. And um, the town manager, you just mentioned you dug through the records and you came up with a figure at the number, but you didn't say what percentage that was. I don't know if you know what percentage that was as far as, you know, looking at do we have historical data of how we have operated when we were by ourselves. I don't have that information right here. I wish I did. Um, If we renovate our own school. So we're looking at 
you know, 30, $350,000, $342,525 savings per year on renovation alone if we're not in the district. Um, the other issue, I mean, in the best case scenario, there's a million five hundred forty-three thousand over the course of the loan that we could save, and it's more like five million dollars that we would save over the over the life of the loan. In twenty years, we're going to save five and a half million dollars by not being part of the full renovation plan. One of the other scary things is, um, and this will tie into the local control comments as well. In the the uh, the plan itself calls for a $131,000 payment of the bond, a million dollar bond that the RSU borrowed. The town of Rundle voted 72% not to accept that bond, yet we're paying it off. Um, the comment was made about we've never approved an RSU 21 budget, yet that budget represents 73% of our local property taxes. And one of the other things, um, if we take, I sat at a budget, a uh, selectman's meeting earlier this year when they talked about taking $5,000 away from the library because they wanted to lessen the burden on the taxpayers. And they also talked about a great length on several items in the $20,000, $25,000 range where they cut back to try to save some money. When you put things back in the municipal budget this year that were held off, such as the multi, you know, very expensive fire trucks and things, try to save money to offset the impact of the RSU 21 budget. If, if we leave the district, we're responsible for our own building, and that's our only capital expenditure. Just this last, last summer, $250,000 of repairs were done to KES. Around $40,000 of that, excuse me, was, kind of right, was a rumble taxpayer money, which we didn't have any vote on. Um, Thorn Academy put a million and a half dollars into their athletic facilities, tennis courts, lacrosse field. Um, the additional cost of rental was zero dollars. If the roof leaks at Thorn Academy, our cost was zero dollars. If we're out of the district and the roof leaks at Kennebunk High School, which would still be an option for us, our cost is zero dollars. Um, our cost to renovate Kennebunk High School if we're out of the district is zero dollars. The, the biggest problem with remaining in the district is we've got a $715,000 item, single line item, that would be the biggest item in our municipal budget. I, I understand, and I was on the school board when we fought with cutting only from the K-5 budget. But what staying in the district does to us, it only gives us a municipal budget to cut from. A municipal budget that's already seen the stressors of being part of the RSU by holding back on large expenditures, by cutting the library expenditure in order to try to save money. So, two thirds of the people in this town don't have kids in the school, but an additional burden. I mean, where are we going to come up with $700,000 to break even on the municipal budget? The town hall administration account is $569,000. You add in $180,000 for the recreation department, and you close those two departments we could break even. If you stop spending $500,000 a year on road repairs for the next 20 years, you still have to come up with $200,000 more per year to offset this renovation plan. Uh, what are our roads gonna look like in 20 years? The other thing, um, lose my train of thought. Give me a minute. Getting old. If we're, if we're cutting things like $5,000 out of the town budget, we're cutting $20,000 items, we've got $715,000 that we need to come up with. It's going to be approved by uh, the Kenny Bunk voters. We can vote it down, but it still may pass, and most likely it may, it may not pass the first time, but it will it'll surely pass eventually. A scary thing that I picked up some information last night, the Came Up High School Renovation uh, Committee met last night, and the architect gave them eight new options. 
the lowest option was $53,807,000. That's $11 million more than the one we're looking at for $715,000. They, they've talked about turning zero into dormitories. That's going to be a major capital expense to which the will be responsible for. If we're out of the district, the only capital expense that we have is this building. And I know it's going to be a lot of stress on this town, but it's up to the new school committee and it's up to the voters of this town to provide, decide what you want and what you're willing to pay for. And I fought for school budgets for 12 years, and I'll fight for them again. The gentleman with the glasses who made the last comment, 23% is what 142,500 would have been of the last uh, school budget for the town of I, I, I would like to answer one of John's comments. I've been a selectman for over 30 years. Every year, when it comes budget time, we look at every item. We try to keep your taxes as reasonable as possible. This year, when we came to that item about the library, we looked at the number of people in the room using the library. The library requested an amount that would cover everyone in a room. The budget board looked at the amount of people using the library and felt that the amount that they requested uh, was a bit unreasonable. So for the number of people using the library, came up with the alternate number. Um, so we did not cut the library cost because of the school budget. Every year, in 30 years, the town has cut town items to help cover the school budget. Whether it was the last year that, that John was on there, whether it was when my kids went in school, because we always wanted our kids to have the best education that we could give them for our tax dollars. But we do not have a lot of tax dollars. This town is becoming more and more uh, a senior citizen town, of which uh, I'm one, and on a fixed budget. I mean, when you are on a fixed budget, you're looking at every expense, whether it's the budget board, whether it's the roads, whether it's the fire department, and again, we're looking at a new town hall. We've been looking at a new town hall for years. It's a case of taking baby steps because we want to make sure our kids have the best education that we can afford. And yes, we always have put off town expenditures so that our kids could have what we felt they needed to afford. That's the minutes again. I'll be pretty quick. Um, so, all the numbers that were just rattled off in the last few minutes supports the exact reason why we came to a third party to try and sort everything out and see what we <laughs> Two questions of five people. Those five people are each of the selectmen. First question is, do you have enough information to make a recommendation? And if so, what is it? Matt, for as long as I've been sitting on this board, we have never made a recommendation on a citizen initiated petition. Never. Not Tabor, not the excise tax question, not zoning questions, not acceptance of streets. Never. We simply don't do it. We don't think it's our problem. That is quite inappropriate for us to do that. And we do it on the Warren article. It's our article. Of course we recommend that. It's kind of silly to have that there. Uh, Mr. Labby, would you like to answer? Uh, I, I guess I agree with my colleagues here. 
but I will say that I see one uh, one option a lot riskier than the other, and I'm not a big risk person. But whatever the vote is of the people, I will abide by it. That's all within my stance. Now we'll say the best for last. <laughs> I was reading today an article in the Portland Press Herald that talked about education and educating our students and consolidation. And when you look at the cost of consolidation as compared to our costs in the river alone, and, and even including uh, a renovation that we don't know what it's going to cost or what's going to happen. We want to give our students the biggest range of programs that we can. And our K through five that we had before, and I put four kids through the school system, and five grandchildren. Uh, their range of programs was limited. And what we had here in the school, I mean, we had an okay school. I'm not saying that we had a terrible school, but the vast improvements that we've seen since joining the RSU, I think, have been absolutely tremendous. And our kids have that vast range of, of programs, and I have two grandchildren in the school even today. I think that when you look at sharing the cost of administration, we talked about administration costs. Well, back then, we had a part-time superintendent, and that superintendent had a full-time secretary. That was administration. That doesn't work anymore because we have to have someone who do the finances. So you've got to have a part-time superintendent, somebody in that office full-time. You've got to have somebody that can handle the finances. So you may have some savings in transportation. And when you're talking about transportation, our town provided the most of the mechanical services for those buses. The town has enough of, a, of its own fleet now, but we can't do that anymore. So now you're talking additional cost of transportation. You're also talking a transportation director or someone who can handle that. So you're talking vastly more administrative costs. And when it comes time for the budget board to meet and for you to go to town meeting, and that budget comes up to the town, and you are told that this is for your kids, that last budget of $6 million, the people passed it with very few questions because it's for your kids. And I think that, that in this town, our best option to me, and I'm going out all in here, is that, that we stay in the LSU. Thank you. something that has precedent set, but this is 70% of our budget, the education of our children going on into perpetuity. This isn't a $2,500 item. This is the largest amount 
that our tax dollars in town spend. So it's just disappointing to see how much time the Board of Selectmen and the Budget Board will spend on a $2,500 item and they come up with recommendations for all 50 items that are listed there, but they won't come up with a recommendation on, on this. It's, it's disappointing. You can take that how you may. I'm not, all I'm saying is that it is disappointing when you go and you vote for a $2,500 item and you say, well, yeah, the Budget Board thinks it's right, the Selectmen think it's right, and then the largest fiscal deal in the whole town, nobody, nobody, one person, well, I'm, I'm disappointed that you don't really understand what is in this document. Because what this document is giving us, what this is giving us is, is the trend and the high level where we have to decide what the future is going to be. If this is not a budget, this is far from a budget. Okay? So if you're trying to pin it down to not as dollars and cents, which several people have tried to do, that's not what we no, have to do. That's not what This is This is a document that was created so that the residents in town could make a decision. And four out of the five selectmen either don't feel comfortable making an opinion or don't feel that this document provides them enough information to make a decision. Is that legitimate? Yes. Is that legitimate? Yes, Matt. Uh, we're, we're, we're all still just trying to figure out what the reasons why we don't make decisions. Aren't those valid reasons? Sure. Then you're not going to be disappointed. Yes. Oh, I can be disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely can, and I am. Um, I just need to clarify my comment. Is I made the comment that I think that the selection we should have one way or another, but I'm not ready. I haven't digested this fully, yet. so it's my my right. If there are things that I'm not sure, there are things that I still don't know. That you know, I need to, to, to dig into this a little bit more. For some of you, it's clear and cut. That's fine, but for me, it's not. Until I, until I really fully digest that, then I'll, then I'll let you know whether I support it, whether I don't. Okay. I think the only actual numbers in here are the renovation numbers that were provided by Andrew Dollar. So what is that? Yeah. Yeah. No, Which haven't? No, no, it hasn't. But the, the, the renovation plan that represents the seven hundred fifteen thousand dollars has been school board approved, and the committee last night looked at options that are far more expensive. See, I see the little so this, you see this, this is hypothetical. Yeah, okay. So we'll, 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 that's right. how to explain to Matt. I see it as two, two real issues. One is the risk of trying to build a budget with not in the special ed. It's going to be what the administrative costs are going to be. That never we, need to that. we never do. Never You're absolutely that. right. Okay. And on the other side, if we want to stay in the RSU, knowing that we're going to have additional costs if, if in fact, those renovations occur. Those are the two, the world will boil it down to those two things, and we have to decide what our appetite is. It's not a right or wrong, it's a question of what our appetite is going to be for those things. Uh, I, I would like to make one little comment, and this is a given. Your taxes are going to go up. Yep. Your taxes are going to go up, whether we are on our own or whether we're in the RSU. So, your taxes are going to go up. So, when I'm sitting with the budget board, when I'm sitting with the selectmen and we're looking at that budget, we decided this year that the town was no longer going to cut the town budget for things it needed, like raises for our employees. Uh, I mean, we were very reasonable about it, but we went a little bit further this year than we have in the past few years in trying to keep your taxes steady. So no matter what you do, your taxes are gonna go up. They are just going to go up a little less one option than the other. Hi, Susie Landry. Um, I just wanted to point out um, that, yes, taxes are going to go up. That's one thing we can count on. Um, but children are our future. They're the future of the whole, the, this whole planet. Whether we have children or not, it's about the children, and I think that's what we need to think about. What's our town going to look like in 20 years if we can't offer a quality education? I can give you a, a good idea of that, having looked to move farther up north in Maine. Any town that my husband and I look at ha has no quality of education because it has aged. We're all going to get older. That's a fact of life. If, you know, we can't let that happen to a rental. We need to just protect our children and continue to provide 
quality education for the future of the town. James and I want to make a point of clarification on one of the things that John mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. At $142,000 for administrative costs, uh, if you were to take that annually at 3% over three years, it would not be $144,000 be well up into the $150,000 in excess of $155,000.
this is just an aside, but I'm a Yankees fan and hate being called a Red Sox fan, and I have inadvertently referred to Sam Stevens as being a reporter from the Kenmont Post several times this evening, and Sam is actually from the York County Coast Star, and I apologize for that, Sam. <laughs> Yeah, 15, and I think that, seeing no further questions,